back to the channel, everyone. Hope you're all doing good. We just got back from Texas 2K, which hopefully you saw some of the videos I put up. They were very amateur, but the idea was to kind of give you an idea of what was going on. Not necessarily be 1320 video or something like that. If you wanted better videos, definitely check them out. Kyle and those guys put together very nice videos. One of the cars that was probably my favorite that we didn't bring would happen to be the AMS Alpha Omega Huracan. Thing was brutal. It looks good with big tires on it. Just great car. Performed very well. Almost trapped 200. So very, very fast. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about a couple of subjects related to Octane and how to pick timing numbers that are going to work if you maybe haven't ever tuned on a given fuel. Um, maybe you live in California, all you have is 91. Maybe you live in Washington and Oregon, you have 92. Maybe you live on the East Coast, you have 93. One octane point doesn't sound like much. But in all three of those examples, the difference is about three degrees of timing and or two or three pounds of boost in an Evo, on average. Obviously, combinations, everything. But that's my experience. So that covers very, very quickly one car. Doesn't answer the question. How do you know that? How do you go about figuring that out? So what we're going to do is we're going to open DinoJet and PEP7 software here. We're going to look at a dyno sheet of something that's pretty non-typical as far as cars that we tune and cars that most tuners are going to see. This is my friend Nathan's Volvo when it still had a Volvo motor in it. It had a 2.5 liter stroker motor. It had some uh, cams in it at this time, I think, or actually maybe this was the stock cams. It did have a 16 valve head. It had a 57 trim Garrett. We were tuning it on ECM link, which... Again, normally a Mitsu product, but thought the bright idea to adapt it into this harness. So one thing that you run into is knock control doesn't work. Knock control is based on bore size. So this particular car, I had to kind of tune it like it was a Honda. And by that, I mean no knock control. So I'm going to say something pretty opinionated. Maybe you agree, maybe you don't. I don't think you're a real tuner if you can't tune a car without knock control. I'm going to give you a, a quick rundown of how to do it so that you can be a good tuner, hopefully, is the goal. So I didn't know where to start. This is a 95 millimeter bore, I believe. It wasn't something that I was really familiar with. So I went to Old Reliable. I used a pump gas timing map that I know works great for 91 octane in a two liter evo punched in the numbers we kind of dialed in the boost a little bit it boost crept obviously just a little so you're kind of seeing the result of that 15.9 pounds peak it made 297 wheel i was thinking man what's going on here you know this is rev to 7500 power band is very similar i believe right here at peak power, I'm going to put the cursor on it. That's about 7,000 RPM, 7,100. I mean, if it was an Evo, I would have been 10 degrees maybe. R11, this was 11 years ago now. 10 and a half years ago, a little bit. So, I started off low, knowing that I was low. And this is the same method you'll use for any car. With or without knock control. If you don't know what you're, you need to do for timing, I added a degree. Huh. Didn't pick up a ton of peak power, but it definitely picked up. And for reference, as I left that out, I started by only adding above 5,500, so this 80 mile an hour line. I added a degree from there up because I figured, you know, I'm not going to make crazy torque, 
risk a head gasket or, or something because I'm not aware of what this could potentially do. Um, if you look back over here, obviously this is runs 12 and 13. So the 11 before it, we were kind of figuring this out. We were getting the boost dialed. We were getting the air fuel where we wanted it. Um, I was starting to realize that, hey, something's not right here. I don't know what. So I just kept giving it a degree, and I gave it a degree. And I was moving up slow. If you start low enough, you know, sometimes you can jump two degrees. You're going to see an example of what happens, how to figure out if two degrees at once is too much. Or, or you could just do the old-fashioned method and back up a degree. But anyway, so as you can see, that one degree, right around here, right around, let's say, 6,000 RPM, 21 horsepower with one degree of timing. We're starting to cure combustion instability. That's what this big chomp is. This isn't actually knock, which will also look similar, but this one, this one was combustion stability. Okay, so we're gonna fast forward one more degree. Oh, starts getting better. I added it everywhere, obviously. Or excuse me. This one I added boost. Left the timing, added boost, gets a little happier. Now we're, all of a sudden, we're up another 20 wheel. We're up right here, somewhere between 12 and 30. Definitely getting better. You see the boost came up, 19 pounds. Okay, so 19 pounds. We're going to take out the blue one here real quick. Take out number 12. So, when I had the boost up that high, I was thinking, it still looks like it's low timing. Let's give it one more degree. It faked me out. Again, I did the same trick. About 5,500 and up, I added timing. I didn't go nuts down here to start with. You can see the boost is pretty much the same. But, from where I did add timing, possibly as low as here, from where I did add timing, now we have huge gains. What, 36 horsepower, right there. Move back just a little bit, you know, a couple hundred RPM, right as the combo is really starting to do some work. That's 60 horsepower right there in one degree. The combustion stability definitely improved all of a sudden the car started making really good power the boost dropped so what happens and this is an easy way to know that you were on the correct side is that if your timing's too low you have a lot of heat energy and a lot of drive power going to the turbine wheel you'll get a lot of boost as soon as you start adding timing and if the boost drops great you're on the low side if it doesn't change eh, okay maybe something maybe something's not quite right but in this case, it dropped two pounds. Okay, so we're going to close these out real quick. We're going to bring 15 back up. We added one more degree. And again, as you can see, timing, or the boost rather, excuse me, boost, not timing. Pretty constant. Air fuel's pretty constant. But now that degree down low, 30 foot pounds, all of a sudden, we started making some power. And it might be that I was heating up the combustion chamber a little bit. We didn't make as much power out the top. We dropped, looks like, 7 horsepower. Could also be statistical anomaly. Boost is pretty pretty close to the same as I accidentally zoom. But in a nutshell, this is how you would sneak up on any motor or any octane that you're not sure about. If you have a good ignition map that you know works for a particular combination. Let's say you're tuning a Subaru or you're tuning an Evo. And you're going to tune the car on 91 octane in California or Arizona. Air temperatures are high. Pull four degrees. Make a pull. It's really hard to hurt a car with low timing. As long as you don't get excessively low, of course. You can start to add and where you add 
and maybe it doesn't change. For sake of discussion, let's say I added a degree everywhere, and here it didn't change. Okay, we know that past this point, past this 85, let's say 6,000 RPM, pull that degree right back out. If there's no change, you are at the minimum best timing for torque. Pull the degree right back out. Leave it out. Leave it where it wants it, where it's obviously doing something, in this case, making power down here. You can do this on cars with knock control, cars without knock control, cars with standalones, and you're not sure if the knock control truly works. Maybe you have an AM Series 2 or an AM Infinity, and you haven't really tried making the knock control work. This is still a strategy that allows you to figure out what timing a particular combination is going to want, hopefully to keep it safe. In this case, this motor lasted for a while. We got greedy, we tried making 600 horse, Ran into some issues one night, and the car ended up with a 2JZ after that. And then that ended up in a Datsun, and now the car has another 2J in it, but that's a different story for a different time. Anyway, hopefully you can kind of see what's going on. This strategy has allowed me to tune cars on 87 octane, 89 octane, to, you know, maybe take advantage of a meth kit where I can use methanol to improve the octane. I get cheaper fuel at the pump that way. I'm going to go on a road trip. You know, I turn the boost down, but I can make sure the car's still safe on low-grade fuel. Uh, something that I've done a lot, and this is a, a tuner tip if you want to accept it, is that if I don't have a particular grade of fuel available, i.e. I don't have California 91, I can go put 89 in it, tune it, Pretend that that's 91. Tune it. Make sure that the car is safe. When they go to put it on California 91, hopefully, you know, it's even safer. I have run into cases where Washington 89 seemed to be better than California 91. Conversely, I've tuned cars from Canada with Canadian 94 that one brand of 94 is definitely worse than 92. Some of the... Uh, Mid-province, Midwest, I guess you would call it for Canada. I'm not quite sure what the term is, so I apologize. Maybe a viewer can correct me on what you'd be uh, putting in your car if you were in Alberta or further east. Um, anyway, or geographic location. Obviously, I know it's 94 octane. Husky, I believe, is the name. That works really, really well. That actually works better than 92. Get a little more aggressive if you want. As I mentioned, 93 octane on the East Coast. I noticed I could run more timing. I could run more boost. I prefer more boost. But that's something that I do. There is a point to where you're going to get the timing so low, though, that adding boost isn't going to make any extra power. So I'm going to switch to that real quick. And we're going to look at an example from my personal Evo when it was on the 2 liter. So this is an example using my personal car. This was a Evo 9 with a stock 2 liter GSC S2s, uh, Magnus V5 intake manifold, and a uh, 3586 Garrett based turbo. So as you can see, boost was pretty high, 28.59 uh, pounds, plus or minus. Uh, one thing I love about dyno jets is the, the boost isn't always accurate. Sometimes that is a higher number, lower number. In this particular case, this was actually closer to 28 pounds, pretty much flat. You can see there at peak power, it shows 27.73. That is really, truly more where we were. 9 degrees made 565.9 wheel at a little bit of boost. In this case, I did add a pound even though it's not really showing it. There was no change in power. Decide to give it more, get her up to 30. And again, I realize what it's showing, but I have the logs, so I know where it was at. Picked up a little bit of torque, did make a little bit more there, but again, 566, 566, 565.9, so 566, nine degrees of timing at 8,000 RPM. It wasn't doing anything. So, easy. 
Let's drop the boost. We'll leave 37. Drop the boost, add one degree of timing. So in two pounds of boost, or one degree of timing, I made more power, more torque. And even though looking back, that's extremely aggressive, and I wouldn't do that for a customer car necessarily unless they didn't mind it having a, a short lifespan. We can we can get the, the feel very fast that you, you find a point where regardless of how much boost you put to a car, if it doesn't have enough timing, it's going to be like that Volvo. It's going to have combustion stability problems. It just can't make more power. It can cause misfires in worst case scenario. Um, sooner or later, it's going to drive the EGT up. It could do some engine damage. But I noticed on the street, which led me to do this test, that I could go up to 32 pounds on 92 octane with that combo, no knock. The car just didn't feel any faster, and I couldn't figure it out. Great, we have a dyno. So, throw it on the dyno. Figure out that, in this case, one degree at two less pounds was worth uh, approximately eight wheel. So, no, still good gain for the, the timing. And the combustion stability seemed way better. You can see there's far fewer dips in the red line versus the blue line. It was a little, little on the edge with that blue line. This particular car, when it was on the stock intake manifold, wouldn't make more than 530 wheel on pump gas. And that same 9 degrees at, at the 28, 29 pounds, it just it wanted to miss. If things weren't perfect, it would just misfire. So, putting this all together kind of gives you an idea of how to creep up on a tune if you're not familiar with it. It's a very common question about how do you decide the ignition map? I can figure out the air fuel. I can tune that on the street myself, but how do I know how to do this? One way, obviously, is a dyno, where you can look and see the gains. Another would be at the track, where you can see mile an hour gain. A little less uh, resolution doing it that way, you might say, because you might put timing where you didn't need it. You wouldn't know. Uh, it would give you a good peak power idea, I guess. But anyway... We prefer dynos. They're safe tools. That's what they're for. I hope everybody's doing good. Uh, looking forward to race season coming up. we got events in April. We've got events in May, June, July, all through the rest of the year. So it's going to shape up to be a good race season. Anyway, talk to you guys later.